Our reading today comes from Revelation chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. To the angel of the church in Ephesus write, These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, and you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. Yet this is to your credit. You hate the works of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Let anyone who has an ear listen to what the Spirit is saying to the churches. To everyone who conquers, I will give permission to eat from the tree of life that is in the paradise of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. You may be seated. love 
others. It's now our church to show the community and each other that we truly care what God is saying in this building and outside this building. And you're a part of this new change. You're a part of this new adventure. And I think we should be a little excited about it. I hope we are. And if not, we'll have hot dogs afterwards when you get out of here. Maybe you'll have to be excited then. But just little things. Little things in this. And so this is an ever-changing world with ever-changing possibilities and things. And these seven different churches that John the Revelator talks about, each one of them are going through different situations of change. And they have to decide where are they going to be when, at the end of the day with this change. Now, I want to just let you know, in these seven different churches, um, uh, most of them didn't make it. I'm just going to say it, only two did out of the seven. Even though the Holy Spirit, God himself, came and whispered to them the direction in which to go and how to take care of things, still five of them decided, no, 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 we're not doing it. And now they're dead forever. And so if you've noticed in our preaching, we have taken you from a wide scope this last year of what sin looks like and where you are in the world view of it. And we've narrowed it down and narrowed it down and narrowed it down to where if you were here, part of our, our seven deadly spirits, um, the deadly sins, the Beatitude sermon series, each one of you went through one of those deadly sins, didn't you? And it kind of hurt a little bit. Amen. I'll be honest. It hurt a little bit. It recognized, it brought you your front attention to maybe just maybe where the sin is in your own life and in your own community. And so we've taken you, taken you, taken you, taken you down to where it's an individual. This is on purpose and means something for you as an individual. Now we are going out and we're going to ask God, where is our church in this community? I believe that God puts a church in a community for a purpose and a reason. And we see that throughout. When I was younger and I just became a Christian, I would go to different churches and I found out one church is a praying church. Whatever they seemed to pray for, God answered. There was another church over here. If they gave an altar call, 50 people would come forward. Another church, they just knew the Bible. They understood the Bible. They understood the, what was everything. And so it was great to go to one of their Bible studies because you would learn so much. The problem is I found out not one church ended up being a good at praying, Bible teaching, or evangelism. What's wrong with us? So I believe God puts many different churches in the community because he knows that we're not all thinking it and trying to get it. What is our main purpose, our main goal? Love others, right? With some stipulations, let's be honest. There's some stipulations, and that's where we get into these different churches throughout the sermon series we're going to find out where they fall. Now, before I start, I just want to say one thing. I love playing games. Anybody else? Go ahead. Raise your hand high if you like playing a game. All right. So the rest of you do not like playing games. Amen? All right. Just don't like. So I know why you don't like playing a game, and I'll talk to you a little bit why you don't like playing the games. The rest of us love playing games. And I know we love playing games because most of us do. It's because it has a, a, an object to it. There's, there's a way of what I call winning. You walk away knowing you won. And I was playing basketball with a little girl this week, and uh, just uh, yesterday, or was it Friday? It was Friday, I think. Friday. And this little girl wanted to show me that she is going to be the bestest basketball player in the world. She's seven. And she was from all of my older churches. So she's out there going to show me. She talked all through lunch while we were eating hot dogs. She's like, I'm going to beat you. I'm going to show you how to ball. I'm like, all right, let's do this, right? So we get out there, and she grabs her basketball and the net's about this high and she runs up and then shoots and it goes in. I'm like, yeah, that's good, that's good. Now she from it and she shoots and makes it and then she grabs the ball and she just runs with it and then shoots again. And, then, and I'm like, that's awesome. And then what happened at that moment? Now, you know you're supposed to dribble before you shoot. You just can't run with the ball and shoot. I started doing something to her. I started adding rules to the game because they're legit rules, right? We all play by these rules, and so why not teach a young person the rules so they can properly play the game and win with pride? Here's the problem. I forgot what the goal of the game was. Get the ball in the net. That's the first thing, isn't it? That's the love of the game. You get excited when the ball goes in the net, not how you dribble the ball. There's not too many people who like, check me out, and never score, right? <laughs> 
<laughs> but I can dribble. <laughs> you know? Well, that's not the game. The game is to get the ball in the net. And so once I started laying some of these rules out for her, like you need to dribble three times and then shoot with your right hand. And then when you're going this way, because now I've, I've become coach. What happened to the game? She stopped. <laughs> she says, I'm done. I took away the fun of the game for her. The very purpose of the game itself. Now she didn't care if she beat me or not beat me. Which again, when I left, I said, man, you really beat me. You know, because I realized what I did to her. I took away her love. Her first love of that game. And I hope I didn't break it forever. But we'll see later when I go and ball with her next year. And I go visit with them. But this is where this church in Ephesians is. Is what we would call a boundary church. A boundary keeping. And that boundary keeping is no more than just rules. I have rules. There are rules that need to be followed. These are the boundaries in which you can be a part of our society and be a part of our church. Follow these boundaries and you're in. If you don't, go somewhere else. Sounds fair, doesn't it? Sounds legitimate, doesn't it? I mean, each and every one of us has, should have rules in our own relationships, right? These are the rules in which the relationship works. And, this, and when you break these rules, no longer should we be in relationship. Sounds fair. Sounds the way it should be. And so this church is no different than other churches. They were coming out in what we call a boundary teaching. Now let me read this to you. And if you have your Bibles, open up to uh, chapter 2, verses 1 in the book of Revelation. And I'm just, I'm just a pet peeve. I'm just going to say it's revelation, not revelations. All right. <laughs> Somebody got on me in seminary. That's why. It says in, in first, two, it's first one, it says, To the angel of the church in Ephesus write. Now, when he's saying this, each and every church has a spirit that is tied to it. Now, it's not a spirit like an angel or a demon that's connected. It's a spirit that is self-grown. It has breathed life into it. It's like a new creation being created for the very first time. It's like a baby breathing for the very first time. Now that baby has a spirit in it. And that spirit becomes basically a part of you and a part of the other persons in, in that environment. And so this is the spirit of this church. And so he's saying, listen to the spirit. Listen to what you've birthed. All right? Now listen carefully. So these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks amongst the seven golden lampstands. He's basically saying he's in control of all words and he walks amongst the churches. This is Jesus. He says, I know your works. You toil for your patient endurance. And I know you cannot tolerate evildoers. Sounds fair. Amen. How many of us want to tolerate an evildoer? Anybody? No. Right? So right now, it sounds like a legitimate boundary. You, you do not tolerate these evildoers. He says, you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not and have found them to be false. Now, when he says this piece, I found them to be false. Ephesian was a, it's a huge port town. And if you go there today, you'll go, really? It's not a port town because the water is way, a couple, about almost two miles away from the town now. And the town's sitting out here in the middle of nowhere. So it was one of those towns that were ever moving. It was ever moving with the water. And it became bigger and bigger because it was one of the major trade routes. And so having a big, giant city where Paul establishes a church, something happens, what we call circuit rider or evangelist would come through the church. And so this evangelist would come through the church and say, this is the word of God for the people of God. And he would preach. And these people would look at their Bibles like you are right now, reading your Bible, right? Every one of you opened it up. And you're reading it and going, no, no, no. That's not what the Bible says here, pastor man. Right? And they were good at that. They were good at knowing their Bible. Just like we are, because I know each and every one of us read our Bible every day. And we're well-educated, well-motivated Christians in this community. Amen? Uh, all, right. all right. And so they were that type, and they would go through, and they would understand who was a false teacher and who was not a false teacher. And they were very particular about it. They also endured a lot of different things, and they wouldn't say it in this, in this particular town. is a huge, huge, what would they would call a temple to one of the Greek or, you know, whatever gods they want to call it at the time. I mean, you study the, the history of the gods, you'll, they changed what who they are and what they are, but the same purpose is always the same purpose. You have to make a sacrifice to it. And so they had this huge temple, and this particular temple, it was known for, well, I don't know how to say it any different, but getting naked. All right? 
So in order to go to the temple, you would go up and you would get unclothed with everybody else and do things that unclothed people do. And in order to, why you did that is because you were trying to receive the food in which they sacrificed to that particular goddess. And so they would say, this is the food to the goddess, and then they would hand out the food to all the people. This happened to be meat. Everybody needed meat. Amen? Amen. There's some vegetarians in here. I am. And so they needed meat. They hadn't learned how to be a vegetarian yet. And so they would have to go to the temple in order to get the meat to feed their kids. That was it. You only had beans and rice or whatever else you could find. But if you wanted the good stuff, you had to go to the temple. And so this particular church, that's why you're saying the impatience and the endurance. They decided that they weren't going to do that as followers of Christ. And because of that, they were ostracized and put into a, a section of town saying, these are the Christians. And so there were two things. The one, they believed the word of God for what the word of God said, and then they acted upon it. And Paul later writes, you know, about, hey, should I eat meat or should I not eat meat? Should I offend the ones around me or not offend the ones around me? And he has that big struggle in it, talking to that church and saying, hey, you know, these are the things that you can do, can't do. Corinth, all those churches were in the same situation. But God is praising them for being people who read the Bible and, and act it out in this sense. He's saying, I get this. This is not easy. This is hard stuff. This is hard stuff. You made a choice and now you gotta live in it. The problem is with this particular town, it kept moving. It kept moving. And so, like any town, I don't know what's happened in Perrysburg yet. Wink, wink, not, not, it did. Um, <laughs> You have old Perrysburg, right? And now you have new Perrysburg. And then wherever you think you are right now in new Perrysburg, new Perrysburg is being built, right? We see six something, something homes being built. With that comes new things, new worldviews, new revelation, new. The old ways are not always going to be the old ways anymore. Some of the old diners and places that we used to shop are not going to be there anymore. It's going to be new. And then we have to decide as individuals, is it okay? Or do I go with it? And the church was in that same boat, working and walking and trying to understand, do I go with it? Or do we make our stance? So I also know you endured patiently and very enough for the, for the sake of my name. And that you have not grown weary. And then he says this, like any good relationship, right? Dear, I love you, but. Right? Dear, I love you, but. Now, how many of us do that? Just me, right? Amen. Don't raise your hand. <laughs> That's not on camera. And so, <laughs> you know, it's that, it's that, hey, I want to love you, but here's some hard stuff i got to tell you. So, but I have this against you. You have been in the love you had at first. Remember then from where you have fallen and repent and do the works that you've done first. And what he's saying to the church is this. Look, I don't know your salvation experience. I don't know where you've come from when the Holy Spirit reached deep into your heart and moved you into the more. For me, it was September 11, 1993 at 3 a.m. I remember. I was old age, doing old, really bad age stuff. The Holy Spirit jumped into my world, totally changed me, and now I am new age, trying to figure out where I live and walk into this world. I believe with all my heart, you have had the same experience. Whether you've been in the church forever and walking through this building, or maybe it's your first time today, I believe what we call those moments of grace has happened. God has wooed you, wooed you into his presence. And I pray that if it hadn't happened yet, it's happening right now, this minute. So he is saying to the church, remember who you were, and now remember who you are. Because there was a moment you were a fallen person. And there was a moment in your life when you got on your knees and you begged for help. There was a moment in your life where the Holy Spirit reached deep into and changed your whole perception of relationship with everyone and yourself. There was a moment that you understood, and I'm going to say it, church, you were a sinner, and you sin. And some days you still sin. The difference is that you hear the Holy Spirit saying, oh, 
please H, not today. Instead of go for it. And so he's saying, church, remember that piece because it's good for you to be good Bible people. It is good for you to have the scripture memorized. It is good for you to understand that there is a need for boundaries. But don't forget the love you have. Because he simply says this, if you keep doing what you're doing and you do not repent, I will remove your lampstand. Church. We can look at it like this, either orthodoxy or orthopraxy. I would like to look at it with both, orthodoxy with orthopraxy. Orthodoxy is simply the head knowledge or your thoughts on your theology. Each and every one of us have our own theology. We do. I wish it was all the same. Mine, to be honest. Um, we'd all get along a lot better. Um, we all have our own orthodoxy. What we believe God says, and we hold on to those scriptures, and then we hold people up to that, including a pastor. All of our pastors will be held up to whatever this is. And some of you will say we failed. And some of you will say that we passed. And then you'll pick sides of who your favorite players are. You know, this one is obviously fits my orthodoxy, so therefore I will like that pastor and not that one. I get it. I understand. The orthopraxy is simply what it says. The practice of what God is teaching you. What kind of church are we? We are here to... Oh, only three of you. Let's try it again. <laughs> what kind of church are we? We are... That's our orthopraxy. We will learn our orthodoxy with it and that relationship together. Or we can be simply this. We can become referees. And that's the people who don't like playing games because they like the rules a lot more. I'm not picking, but I am. <laughs> they want to be a referee. And I don't know too many people in this world that grew up playing a game going, I want to be the rule keeper first. They usually wanted to play the game. No different than that little girl wanting to just put the basket, the ball in the basket. That was her practice. That was her love. And then you had some big, bald, red-headed guy standing out in 100 degree heat telling her, no, no, these are the rules. What church will we be in Perrysburg this new year, and the year after, and the year after? Will we be a church that loves others or a church that doesn't? Will we own the rules more important to us than the saving grace and the power of the Holy Spirit entering into those around us? Each one of these churches have to struggle where they're going to be and how they're going to be. In. Jesus is saying, be both in. Be both in. Be a rule keeper, but also play the game. And it's okay for somebody to say, hey, let's slow down on that rule a little bit until the rest of us catch up. Amen? Let's not be that church that owns the ball and decides to leave the court while everybody else wants to play because we just don't like how they're doing. Jesus knew that we needed help in all things that we do and who we were going to be. 